I'd like to play with you, and there's, a, there's an outline that you'll, uh, that you'll find there. You can use that if you want to take, uh, take down some notes. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a passage from Scripture, uh, and then we're going to pray. It'd be great if you have your Bibles there. We're going to be looking at a number of Bible passages uh, in the next little while, and it'd be great if you could check that what I'm saying is actually what those passages are saying. So let me read for us Galatians chapter 3. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, we'll be reading from verses 1 to 14. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as, if, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Nor then that his laws of faith by the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So that those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it's written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do. Now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the promises that you have made to us, and for the blessings that we can receive through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we do pray now that as we into this final session, thinking about the prosperity gospel in the light of your, of your word, we pray that you would give us great and discernment and clarity. That we would know what the true blessings you offer us are. And that we would always be trusting in Jesus. His death for us and holding fast to our hope of eternal life. Pray that you would help me to speak clearly in Jesus. Amen. Amen. But God wants you to be healthy and Wealthy, if you just have enough faith and obedience to the Lord, you can ask for riches and they will be yours. Just name it and claim it. Think better about yourself. Recognize you're a beloved child of God. Work hard and use what you have responsibly. And uh, the sky is the limit as to what you can do through your Assets. So Craig Blomberg summarizes prosperity teaching in his book, Christians in an Age of Wealth. And we've had a great introduction to that tonight already. Now the prosperity gospel teaches us that God wants to bless believers with health, wealth, and prosperity now, if only they take hold of these blessings by faith in Jesus. It's a gospel that has attracted a widespread hearing. One uh, survey found that 46% of Americans have accepted prosperity teaching in some form. We've heard of Benny Hinn, Joel Osteen, Joseph Prince, Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland. They're some of the most famous uh, prosperity teachers, just to name a few. And it's very big here in Malaysia too, isn't it? Whether it's uh, many churches or, or even smaller churches as well. The offer goes out every Sunday. Become a Christian. God will not only save you, he will bless you physically and materially in this life. It's 
So that's our question. Does God actually promise all believers will be healthy and wealthy? Can Christians expect material wealth now if they are godly? Or is that a lie? Well, my aim uh, this evening is not just uh, uh, as we examine the prosperity gospel, it's not just to protect us from uh, the big name prosperity preachers. Because actually we're, in, we're all in danger of accepting milder, uh, subtler, softer forms of the prosperity gospel. And that shows through in our attitudes to money, shows through in our attitudes to suffering, and so on. And uh, if we think we're not in danger of ever believing some form of the prosperity gospel, then we're actually in great danger. Well, we've heard this evening, the prosperity gospel has three main teachings. You see them on the outline. We're going to go through them uh, in turn. The first is that God promises material blessing to the Christian. Now, in my role with the equip, I'm sometimes uh, invited to churches to run a course called Bible Overview. I commend it to you. Well, some uh, years back, I was uh, invited to uh, to run this course at a, at a church somewhere in KL, made nameless. I, I attended the Sunday service to give a promo for the course. Uh, and that day, the, the, uh, the pastor's wife was preaching on Genesis 12. Uh, you might remember uh, those verses, Genesis 12, on the screen. Uh, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your kindred, your father's house, to the land I will show you. I will make a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. He who is dishonest, you are, uh, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so she explained those promises to Abraham. Fame, land, offspring, blessing. I call it flop for short. Blessing for the nations. And she pointed out Abraham's faith in the promises of God, how he, how he left uh, his land to, 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 to go to the promised land. And she pointed out how God made him rich in his journeys. So far, so good. And then she quoted from Galatians chapter 3, which we just read. It's like, oh, it's not the you know, okay. Galatians 3 in your Bibles. <laughs> Know then that it is those of faith who are, who are the sons of Abraham, the scriptures foreseeing that God will justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed, so that those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And then she proceeded to the application. If you put your faith in God, you too will be a child of Abraham, you will share in his blessing. And what was Abraham's blessing? Riches. Abundance. Material goods. Put your faith in Christ and you will be blessed abundantly and materially now. Uh, to prove her point, she went on to verse 13 of that passage. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And so she asked the question, what is the curse of the law? And she went back to Deuteronomy 28, where God outlines God's covenant with his people, the old covenant. You read Deuteronomy 28. God says, if they obeyed him, he would bless them. He would bless them with abundance. He would bless them with prosperity, with good health. If they disobeyed, they would face his curse, poverty, disease, destruction, and so on. And then she moved to the application. On the cross, Jesus took away the curse of the law. He took upon himself poverty and sickness and defeat, and he did it so that the Gentiles might receive the blessing, prosperity, health, abundant success. This is how one uh, prosperity preacher, Copeland, puts it. Jesus bore the curse of the law on our behalf. 
Consequently, there's no reason for you to live under the curse of the law, no reason for you to live in poverty of any kind, since God's covenant has been established and prosperity is the provision of this covenant. You need to realize that prosperity belongs to you now. Well, what do you make of such preaching? And there's been lots of Bible passages quoted so far and explained. And at first sight, it seems like a rather compelling argument, doesn't it? After all, they're, they're quoting Bible verses that are, that are clearly related to one another. But this example shows the first major problem with prosperity teaching. And that is a lack of understanding of biblical theology. Now, biblical theology refers to the way that the, the whole Bible fits together as one story centered on Jesus and the gospel. Biblical theology helps us to read the Old Testament in the light of Jesus and the gospel. And so, yes, it is true that, that, that God blessed Abraham with riches. He did. And yes, it is true that God promised his people in Israel, if they obeyed, they'd be blessed. If they disobeyed, they'd be blessed. And those blessings were, were material blessings. But prosperity teaching regularly makes the mistake of applying Old Testament passages directly to Christians today. And so the key, the key question, according to Galatians, is this. What is the blessing of Abraham that Christians have received? Now, if you look very carefully at Galatians chapter 3, it is very clear that the blessing we have received is not abundant riches, but a right relationship with God. Look, look again at verse 6. Does he who supplies the spiritual and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed, so that those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham. The man of faith. So what's the blessing of Abraham that has now been made available to, to all of the nations? It's the blessing of a right relationship with God, is it not? We have been justified. We have been counted righteous simply because of our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Galatians 3 is about. And so what prosperity teachers often fail to understand is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The, the, old, the old Covenant is physical. You have a physical people who are saved from physical enemies, i.e. Pharaoh and Egypt. They're saved to live in a physical place, the promised land, where they would have a physical blessings and live with a physical uh, building to represent God's presence among them. But, but the problem is, Christians are not under the Old Covenant. We're under the New Covenant. That's why we don't sacrifice animals every day we come together on a Sunday morning. I'm very thankful for that. And at the heart of the New Covenant is not physical blessings, but spiritual blessings. And so again and again, prosperity teachers will take Old Testament passages that are about the Old Covenant and apply them directly to the New Testament believer without seeing how the New Covenant changes things. Now, a classic example of this is the prayer of Jabez. Who's read about that book before? <laughs> now, Jabez is a, is a particularly obscure character mentioned in 1 Chronicles. You've probably never heard of him unless you've read the book. He's only got two verses in the whole Bible. This is what it says. Jabez called upon the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, that your hand might be with me, that you would keep me from harm, so that it might not bring me pain. And God granted what he asked. And so someone wrote a whole book <laughs> on these two 
verses. And it was, it was a prayer that you would pray. You would pray that God would enlarge your borders, which he redefined as, enlarge your finances, advance your career, and God will do it just like he did for Jabez. But it's a proof text, isn't it? It's taking these two short verses of the Old Testament, which are under the Old Covenant, and applying them directly to the Christian, without regard to the context, and without regard to the cross. But applying the Old Testament as if we're still under the Old Covenant is not just wrong, it's actually very foolish. Because the reality is that none of us can keep the Old Covenant. We see that in Galatians 3 verse 10. All who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. And so the problem with putting ourselves back under the old covenant is that we can't keep it. See, the, the Old Testament, it only ever brought the curse to the end and not the blessings. Uh, the Old Testament, the law and so on, is, is designed to drive us to the cross. It's to, it's to show how we cannot obey, and so if blessing depends in any way on us, we will never receive. It's designed to drive us to Jesus, to the cross. Where he dies, he takes that curse on our behalf. He is punished for us, so that through his death, we receive those blessings of the new covenant. We receive forgiveness, we declare righteous, we receive the promised spirit. And so the, the problem with the prosperity gospel is that it distracts people away from the real blessings, these wonderful spiritual blessings that we really need. Well, that's the first point, material blessings. The second key promise of the prosperity gospel is healing. And so prosperity theology teaches that uh, miraculous healings were not just for the apostolic era, but they are to be expected as part of the church's life today. So Gloria Copeland writes in her book, God's Will for Your Healing. You must know that it is God that God's will is to heal you. You have a covenant with God that includes divine health. Every Christian does. The problem is being that most Christians do not know that healing belongs to them. And so she says that Jesus came to redeem you from sickness. The prerequisite for that healing is faith. Uh, if, the faith if, the, if the healing fails to uh, materialize, that must be because you don't have enough faith. Uh, one guy called Freeman, he wrote that. This, there are no exceptions to the promises of God. God will fulfill all that he has pledged to do if we meet the conditions. So do your part, have enough faith, healing is guaranteed. Now, probably the most famous verses used in support of this faith healing uh, is Isaiah 53. Probably very familiar with these verses. Surely he is born our griefs, carried our sorrows, we seek him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought his peace. With his wounds, we are healed. And what prosperity teachers point out is that uh, the words of this verse translate, the word translated grief here, verse 4, uh, could also be translated sicknesses. You see that in the footnote. Uh, and sorrows can be uh, translated as pains. And so in this way they will argue that, that Jesus died, because we know this passage is fulfilled by Christ, they would say that Jesus died not only to deal with our sins, but to deal with our sicknesses and our pains, and verse, as verse 5 puts it, uh, by his wounds, with his wounds, we are healed. Now, is that then a compelling promise that Jesus died to bring us physical healing? What do you think? Well, the answer, of course, is no. 
Because once again, these verses are taken out of their context. Because in the book of, of Isaiah, the language of sickness is a metaphor for suffering under the judgment of God. And healing, therefore, is a metaphor for forgiveness. We see this very clearly in the first chapter of the book of Isaiah. God says, why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint, from the sole of the foot even to the head. There's, there's no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and, 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 and war, raw wounds, and they're actually exactly the same words that we find in Isaiah 53. They're not pressed out or bound or softened with oil. Your country lies desert. Your cities are burned with fire. And your very presence foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as of overthrown by foreigners. You see very clearly in those verses that sickness is a metaphor for suffering under the judgment of God. The metaphor is first. You're sick from head to toe. And then the explanation, verse 7. You're under God's judgment. And so in Isaiah 53, when it says, by your wounds, by his wounds you are healed, it's not talking about physical healing. It's talking about a spiritual healing, saving from the judgment of God. By taking upon himself the spiritual sickness of sin, by, by bearing its blows on our behalf, the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, enables the sins of his people to be atoned for. To be forgiven. Now, it's not, uh, we haven't finished yet because prosperity teachers will then go on to quote from Matthew 8, verse 17, as proof that Isaiah 53 really does talk about physical healing. Uh, you see the verses on the screen. When Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother in law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons. He cast out the spirits with the word. He healed all who were sick. So amazing miracles. Verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took out illnesses and bore out diseases. So it's an important passage because in the context, Jesus performs physical healing, doesn't he? And then the quotation comes, quoting from Isaiah 53, which we just read. Now, does that mean Isaiah 53 is about physical healing? Well, it's important at this point that we understand the purpose of Jesus' miracles. Now, some will argue that because Jesus did miraculous healings, we should expect exactly the same kind of miracles today. I think that is to uh, not understand the significance of Jesus' miracles. Uh, Jesus' miracles show that Jesus truly is the long-awaited Messiah who has the power to bring forgiveness. In other words, Jesus' mature miracles show who he is. That the purpose of the miracles is to show his, his identity. And we see just a few late chapters later in Matthew chapter 9, uh, this in the healing of the, of the paralyzed man. It's a, it's a famous uh, story, just put on the screen there. I mean, you remember the story, but this man paralyzed. His four friends carry him and he's, he's lowered through the roof in front of Jesus and then Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, and, uh, and then he gets up and, and walks. Now, why does Jesus heal the paralyzed man? Why does Jesus heal him? He doesn't do it immediately, does he? Why does he heal him? And so there in verse 6, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he heals the man. So it's to show who Jesus is. He is the Son of Man who has authority to forgive sins. 
So that's the first function of Jesus' miracles. They show who he is. But they also have a second function, and that is to, to foreshadow the glorious kingdom that he's bringing. Because one day his kingdom will come in its fullness. There will be a new creation when all that spoils our world, sin, suffering, sickness, and death, that they, they will be no more. And here in Jesus' ministry, we have a glimpse of it. He's going to bring full restoration, body and soul. And so this brings us to the second major problem in the prosperity gospel, what we might call eschatology. Uh, people will hear that word sometimes they think of snails, right? Sounds a bit like a snail, doesn't it? But eschatology is about the, about the end times. Uh, the problem with prosperity uh, theology is not so much what it promises, but when it promises. It, it promises the things of the end. Now. And so when Jesus returns to bring in his kingdom, we will have perfect health. There won't be any more sickness or death. We will have eternal life. We will have great abundance and prosperity in the riches of the new creation. But that's the future. It's not now. Now we expect not prosperity, but Suffering, not health, but sickness and death, because we still live in these mortal bodies that are passing away. Well, the third aspect of prosperity teaching is positive confession, or more properly, this name it and claim it. As we've heard, it's a statement spoken in faith of what one desires or is requesting from God. It's based on the conviction that there are certain spiritual laws activated by positive confessions of faith. So Joel Osteen uh, writes these words, it's not God's lack of resources or your lack of talent that prevents you from, from prospering. Your own wrong thinking can keep you from God's best. You will produce what you're constantly seeing in your mind. If you foster an image of defeat and failure, that's the kind of life that's, then you're going to live that kind of life. But if you develop an image of victory, success, health, abundance, joy, peace, happiness, Nothing on earth will be able to hold those things from you. Now, the key text for prosperity teachers on positive confession is Mark chapter 11, verses 22 to 24. Jesus said, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass. It will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it. And it will be yours. So prosperity teachers insist you must have so much faith that you confess with your lips that it is yours before you even have it. We've heard that already. So the sick person prays in faith for healing. They testify that they are already healed, even if the symptoms persist. Many prosperity teachers will say, if should not be in your prayers. So Austin writes these words. What you expect is what you will get. If you dwell on positive thoughts, your life will move in that direction. If you continue with negative thoughts, you will live a negative life. If you expect defeat, failure, or mediocrity, your subconscious mind will make sure that you lose, fail, or sabotage every attempt to push above average. You have to change your thinking before you can ever change your living. And here we see the main problem with the, uh, this kind of name it and claim it theology. And that is its tendency to treat God only as the giver and not the Lord of our lives. So ultimately, under this kind of theology, man is responsible for his own destiny and God is our servant. And God can't do anything unless we release him by our 
So prosperity, uh, the prosperity gospel then becomes thoroughly man-centered. It reduces faith to a force and prayer to coercion. But the thing is, God is not obligated to give us whatever we want. We're obligated to Him. And in this passage, Mark chapter 12, Jesus is encouraging His disciples to have a true faith. A faith that's confident that God answers His prayers. Our, our prayers, but that doesn't mean that God will answer every prayer I have with yes. Whether I ask for a career advancement or a bigger house or a Mercedes Benz to drive home with later tonight. Well, if that's the, 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 the errors, then what, what does the Bible actually teach about which you're blessings in the Christian life? I'm just going to do this very quickly. Well, at its core, prosperity, the prosperity gospel is based on a kernel of truth. That is the goodness of material blessings. Everything God has created is good, including money. But though material blessings are a good gift of God, Scripture warns us that they are also one of the primary means of turning away hearts from God. The very fact that material blessings are good means that we can be tempted to love them and want them more than God. They can be idols. Scripture warns us of loving money in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world. We can take nothing out of it, but if we have food, Clothing. With these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many things. So the prosperity gospel actually puts people in terrible danger. Because it tempts people to idolize wealth instead of serving God. But that's not the Christian life. For sanctification, the gospel brings transformation in our attitude to material blessings. And you can see that in this passage, if we have, verse 8, if we have food and clothing, the previous passage says. If we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. So Paul exemplifies what the Lord Jesus teaches. We don't store up treasures in earth. On earth, we store up treasures in heaven. We don't seek after food and clothing like the Gentiles do. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the Sermon on the Mount. And so the gospel ought to bring a radical transformation in how we view material possessions. Now that can be seen uh, in no more, in no, uh, nowhere more strongly than Mark chapter 10 and the story of the rich ruler. It's ironic, it's actually one of the favorite passages that prosperity preachers will pick, but they totally misunderstand. Remember the passage, Mark chapter 10. There's the, the rich ruler who comes up to Jesus, asking that great question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And remember Jesus' response to him in the end. Verse 21, he says, You lack one thing, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And decided by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So Jesus knows that the only way to be saved is to come to him in faith with total dependence. We need to rely totally on Him and not on ourselves. Like the little children in the previous verses. And so He challenges this rich man to sell his riches and follow Jesus. But He can't. Because money is His idol, which He loves more than God. And then Jesus looks at the disciples and his verse. Jesus looked around. How difficult it is for those who have wealth 
to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It's, it's a stark saying, isn't it? How foolish then to think that the gospel is about getting rich. It's harder for a rich person to get you. And for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle. Now look at Peter's response. It's the right response. Peter began to say to him, see, and slide next. We have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. And in the age to come eternal life, that many who are first will be last and the last. First, you see why that's a favorite passage of prosperity teachers. At this point, they will uh, get out their wallet, right? They'll take out their, uh, you know, 50 ringgit. You don't give this to God, he's going to give you a hundredfold. <laughs> back in return. So give you a 10 ringgit, or this is 50 ringgit. So get back your 5,000. It's a good investment, isn't it? So Copeland writes, do you want a hundredfold return on your money? Give and let God multiply it back to you. But in such a context, would Jesus really be encouraging us to seek wealth? Wasn't it the rich man's luck and money that kept him out of the kingdom? No, rather, this passage is a wonderful example of what we should be doing. Putting Jesus first in our life, being willing to leave everything to follow him like the disciples did, no matter what the cost. And of course we should. Because that's what Jesus did for us. He left the glories of heaven to find human form, died on the cross for our sins and shame. And as we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus as a promise here, isn't it? There, there'll be sufferings. There'll be persecutions. But also Jesus' wonderful assurance. No matter what we give up for following Jesus, it will also be worth it. You get a hundredfold more now in this time. What's it mean? It means you'll be a part of God's family. We'll have spiritual brothers, sisters, mothers around the world, and as he leads our fathers here, we've got one father in heaven. We have a heavenly father who loves us. One day we'll receive eternal life. Well, then he's perfect. That's a great assurance as we leave everything to follow Jesus. And so instead of seeking money and comfort in this life, we are to follow the Lord Jesus. We are to love him, proclaim him, be willing to suffer for him, that others may come to know the spiritual riches of forgiveness and place where it's in. We are to set our hope on earth for heavenly treasures, not earthly treasures, on God's glorious kingdom, not the desires of the flesh. We will have a true and lasting future in one day. But it's not now. Well, conclusion. We've seen the prosperity teaching and twist scripture by taking verses out of their context, making proof texts, and makes false promises, and makes God my servant there to fulfill my desires. What should be our attitude to such teachings as these? Uh, I think Paul helps us in Galatians chapter 1 is our last passage this evening. Paul says, I'm astonished. If you're so quickly deserting him, you hold you in the grace of Christ and then turn into a different gospel. Not that there is another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. 
But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you at the contrary to the one we preach to you, then can be a curse. As we've said before, so now I say again. If anyone is preaching to your gospel contrary to the one you received, then you be a curse. Paul doesn't mince his words, then does he? But it's true that false gospels like the prosperity gospel, they do send people to hell. We should hate such teaching. We should oppose such teaching. We should pray that God will turn those who preach it and those who follow it back to Him. It does matter. But before we get to too complacent this evening and we all go out and we've all got it right. We should take care lest we are attracted to a subtle form ourselves. I think many Christians have very little place of suffering in the Christian life. Sometimes we think that if I go to church, if I live God's way, if I serve in a ministry faithfully, then God owes me. He, he has to bless me. And that means that things need to go well in my life all the time. And that's why when things don't go well, when we get sick or when we lose our job or when we struggle with our finances or we well, then we start to get bitter with God. Where are you, God? We get angry with God. How could you do this to me after all I've done for you? Why haven't you given me the life that I want? And that, friends, is, is just a tamer, more subtle version of the same prosperity gospel. Because God doesn't owe us anything. And our expectation is not ease in this life at all. We owe God everything. And our expectation is suffering now, glory later. So that's our hope in the life to come. And if we truly believe that, we'll be thankful for every spiritual blessing that we have now. And we'll be willing to sacrifice everything that we have materially in serving Christ and his gospel as we wait for his return. That's the true gospel, isn't it? Now let's serve as pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you once again that you sent your son Jesus to die for us on that cross. We thank you that he left the glories of heaven to take our place, to take our place on that cross. He bore our sin, the wrath that we deserve, that we might be declared righteous before you, that we might become your children. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness that we now have received. And we thank you for the hope that you have given us of this glorious new creation where there is no more sickness or suffering or death. Anymore. And so, Lord, as we, as we do face troubles in this life, Lord, we pray that you would help us not to be tempted to believe the possible miracles. Help us to hold fast to the true hope that will bring us real joy and assurance. Help us to keep looking forward to Him. And so we, all of our life, we take up our cross and follow Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you very much.